Right. So Marie-Jeanne Rossignol is a professor of American studies. She's a specialist of the early American Republic, and she's currently preparing a book on anti-slavery in the United States between the 1750s and the 1830s. In 2017, she edited with Bertrand van Riembeek a translation and critical edition of some historical accounts of Guinea, Benazis, 1771, pamphlet against the slave trade. Uh, in 2016, she also published a collection of essays on the anti on, on Benazi. And we have a long-standing collaboration. We published a, a translation of William Wells Brown's narrative and the French in that collection that I showed you. And uh, we work together on uh, the writing history from the margin uh, project. And uh, Marie-Jeanne's title uh, today is Du Bois and his intellectual forebears, black founder Richard Allen. Thank you, Claire. And uh, I realize no one hasn't believed you. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> let's do that. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yesterday afternoon, um, maybe some of you were here, or maybe of you, many of you were here, and there was this panel on um, uh, Du Bois exhibitions, uh, 1900 exhibition, and the recent uh, exhibition in Paris uh, called uh, The Color Life. And in fact, um, a number of uh, slides were shown, a number of photographs of the uh, recent exhibition were shown, and on one of them, there was this list of black intellectuals uh, on, on some sort of a screen, plastic screen. I don't know if anybody remembers that. Well, the first name, the first name in the list was Richard Allen. So um, before I start my paper, I'm going to show you a number of uh, uh, images uh, of Philadelphia at the time of Richard Allen's uh, life there. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this list of images. Uh, they were drawn, they were watercolors drawn by Pavel Svinin, who was a Russian diplomat in Philadelphia uh, or in uh, North America at the time, traveling, 1812, 1813. So in, in this first uh, watercolor, you see a group of chimney sweeps, two of them. Or, um, well, I don't know if Pavel Svilin was a professional uh, artist, you know, so they, uh, sometimes the drawings have very uh, bizarre scales. Okay. But you see the two chimney sweeps in very poor clothing, uh, together with a man, a black man, in a very uh, nice uh, attire. Okay. This could very well have been Richard Allen, because part of his money was built on running a chimney sweeping uh, business. Uh, this other um, watercolor shows uh, wood sawyers in Philadelphia plus a nanny coming, okay, so it could give them a pleasant piece of news. Uh, this other drawing shows the nightlife in Philadelphia. This is an oyster bar uh, just out of um, a theater in Philadelphia, still the same date. So I wanted to show you those watercolors because they, they are in fact really used books on blacks in the early American Republic. They are, um, I first saw a black and white reproduction in um, Gary Nash's uh, Forging uh, the Black Community in Philadelphia. And I think they, they give you an idea of what Richard Allen's world was like, seen from a Russian point of view, uh, which is an interesting take on Philadelphia in 1812, 1813. And I'm going to return to Richard Allen now. Um, so the, the title for my talk was Du Bois and his intellectual forebears. And Richard Allen is the first in the list, as we saw um, yesterday. Du Bois, uh, and I always say Du Bois, and now I know I should not. So <laughs> Du Bois has long been a favorite with French thinkers and intellectuals. An activist, a multi-talented intellectual, he stands out among other people of his generation as a result of his breadth of vision and action. With his coining the double consciousness concept in 1903 in the sort of black folk, we, sparked, we feel that he sparked the onset of our racial modernity. To us, Du Bois embodies the very origins of the 20th century civil rights movement, as well as the roots 
of pan-Africanism. Uh, there is a book which came out two or three years ago in France by Caroline Roland Diamond uh, called uh, Black America. And this book um, was, in fact, a new uh, branch history of the civil rights movement. And so the author, Caroline Roland Diamond, um, decided you know, to, to write a new type of history of the uh, civil rights movement. And, and so she started the, the civil rights movement. She, she called it the long civil rights movement. She started in 1865. A study of the long civil rights movement, she said, should start with the ending of the civil war in 1865. And in fact, this more or less corresponded to the date of Du Bois' uh, birth in 1868, you know, by three years, as if the previous decades were not part of the civil rights movement, as if they were not worth in investigating if you were writing a history of the civil rights movement. So in this paper, I want to urge French intellectuals mainly, because I know that uh, Americans know about Allen and the Black Founders, but it's not so sure in France. So I want to to urge them to shake free of this view of African American intellectual life. Frederick Douglass, Du Bois, and James Baldwin, the three of them widely thought in France to be the major African American thinkers, all recognized the inspiration of those whom Richard Newman has called the Black Founder. And Richard Newman should be in Paris uh, next week. I will make this note. Among those Black Founders, who lived and wrote at the end of the 18th century and at the beginning of the 19th century, one major figure stands out, to whom Douglas, Du Bois, and Baldwin all paid tribute. His name was Richard Allen. Allen was born a slave in Maryland in 1760, before the American Revolution even broke out. He died in 1831, just as immediate abolitionism rose as a major interracial movement in the United States. He was then such a major and popular figure that black communities came to commemorate Allen's birthday, February 14, as a day of black pride. Frederick Douglass later claimed February 14 as his own birthday. And you know, there's a great uncertainty who was born exactly. In 1922, Carter G. Woodson, so I'm going to talk about Carter G. Woodson in, <laughs> in the end, launched Negro History Week, later to become Black History Month, and it shows February long celebrated by the African American community as a special month. In the Souls of Black Folk, Dubois praised Richard Allen, and so did James Baldwin in his preface to the final son. So who was Richard Allen? Why did Douglas, Du Bois, and Baldwin recognize him as a source of inspiration? In which ways did he shape African American thinking? And why has he proved such a lasting influence? Examining the life and writings of Richard Allen makes it possible to contextualize the idea of African-American double consciousness, the source of so-called black nationalism, nationalism, black nationalism, <coughs> complex um, issue in the early 19th century, and also the tradition of black protest. But the life of uh, Richard Allen makes it also possible to see evidence of the first interracial progressive alliance and also the idea of black republicanism. Allen, and I'm not going to show more slides now, so you have to listen to me, sorry. Um, <laughs> Allen grew up in a world which was deeply reconfigured due to the impact of the American Revolution and human rights ideology. A process of emancipation had begun in the British American colonies before 1760 due to the tireless efforts and radical rhetoric of Quaker activists such as John Woolman, Anthony Pernese, leading to the liberation of Pennsylvania slaves mainly. This process remained marginal until the beginning of the War of Independence in 1775, still affecting mainly Pennsylvania and its capital, Philadelphia. With the War of Independence, emancipation became much more common and was widely debated. In the North, slavery was everywhere put on the road to extinction by 1804. While in the South, many planters freed their slaves on an individual basis. Among the many reasons making emancipation acceptable in, the, in North America was the spread of evangelical religion, most particularly Methodism, a type of Protestantism, and my students never know about that, so that's why I explain it, that broke with rigid Calvinism, insisted on the importance of sanctity. Okay, a convert to Methodism, himself a preacher and a hard worker, 
Allen bought his freedom from his master in the 1780s and moved from Maryland to the nearby city of Philadelphia, which was to become the mecca of African Americans before the Civil War. It remained the largest city in the U.S. until the 1820s. Once there, he became part of a community of free blacks, among which he could connect with other influential black figures, such as Minister Absalom Jones or businessman James Baldwin. Joining a church in Philadelphia, he witnessed the growing segregation of black congregants in the late 1780s. They were asked to sit on the balcony of the church. He would not take this. In the face of such discrimination, Allen led African American church members to leave the church. Already a successful businessman through the chimney sweeping operation and uh, the many uh, homes he rented, Allen bought a plot of land and he had a small building moved to the site. The church became Bethel, and this was to be the first church of a totally independent African-American religious denomination, the African Methodist Episcopalian Church. So this is this radical move from a mixed uh, church to a black church, uh, which Du Bois salutes in the Souls of Black Church. <coughs> to Du Bois, through this act of protest, Richard Allen launched the existence of independent black churches, which were to play such a significant role in the development of African-American culture and tradition of protest until the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s, and of course, much later. Allen's biographer, Richard Newman, makes this clear, that this move away from a white church did not anticipate black nationalism, did not signify a rejection of common values. He describes Allen as deeply sharing the ideals of the American Republic. To Newman, the building of an independent church amounted to a nonviolent but confrontational strategy meant to influence American civic culture by portraying and establishing blacks as agents who did not deserve discrimination and could hold their own ground if necessary, first deserving the equal citizenship, citizenship which was de denied them. By 1793, Allen's church was thriving, but those high hopes of equality were dealt a major blow. And now comes a very famous episode in the history of ideas uh, of the late uh, 18th century in the United States. There was a yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia in the fall of 1793, and African Americans declared the, their civic mindedness by serving as nurses and undertakers. Though they were also affected by the disease, they benefited from some immunity and thus died in a far lesser proportion than once, at least in the early months of the uh, early weeks of the epidemic. However, they were accused of having exploited the white population's weakness to enrich themselves in a well publicized pamphlet which was circulated by a prominent white editor, Matthew Kelly. Richard Allen did not take this. He reacted by pioneering what was to become a mainstay of black protest in the United States. The 1794 pamphlet, a narrative of the proceedings of the black people during the late awful calamity in Philadelphia. This was the first in a series of publications he uh, published during his career. To pen the pamphlet, he teamed with fellow minister, Absalom Jones, another black figure in Philadelphia. More importantly, fully aware of the importance of the text, he took a copyright for it. And he followed the narrative with an attack on racist Americans, addressed to the mayor of Philadelphia, and entitled, An Address to Those Who Keep Slaves and Approve the Practice. By 1794, there was already, as everyone knows, uh, a sizable body of literature by African Americans published in Britain and the United States, poems, slave narratives, early ones, and spiritual journals. Uh, so I'm going to skip that because all those names, Phyllis Whitley, Otto Baku, Joano, uh, are all well known. Yet Allen and Jones's address to those who keep slaves, written in the immediate wake of the public opinion campaign engineered against African Americans by one of their fellow Americans, is seen as Richard, by Richard Newman as a turning point in the making of racial modernity. What defines this a particular part of the pamphlet is the skillful analysis of the workings of racial prejudice. Allen explains that African Americans should not be accused of being intellectual, intellectually or culturally inferior. On the contrary, what blacks suffer from are racial stereotyping and physical oppression on the part of white Americans. He first lays the blame on the white population. 
and suggests that a common Christian faith, faith could reconcile blacks and whites, thus paving the way toward a multiracial society. Well, this part of the pamphlet became so famous in anti-slavery circles in Philadelphia that white abolitionist Warner Mifflin uh, took it along uh, as on his anti-slavery travels. Allen did not drop his aggressively patriotic stance in the coming years, uh, which culminating, uh, culminated with his eulogy of George Washington on the white founder's death in 1799, probably only because George Washington had freed his slaves. Unlike other white founders, such as Thomas Jefferson, Washington had been instrumental in popularizing emancipation. Though Allen remained friends with a number of white activists at the turn of the century, anticipating the later interracialism and abolitionism, yet his black patriotism and republicanism were sorely tested in the early 1800s. In particular, in late uh, uh, yes, in, in late 1799, a petition uh, he sent to Congress asking for a better integration in civic life was turned down. And in 1800, blacks in New York City were made to understand they could not take part in the independent state celebration on July the 4th. By the late 1800s, Allen and others in the black community started to realize that they could not simply trust in the United States. They formed what? Newman again, but also many other historians call it a nation within a nation. And they could not um, simply aim at assimilating into a mainly racist community. So in the next 20 years, African Americans and Richard Allen in particular experimented with various ways of dealing with their double consciousness. One way was for blacks to embrace moral uplift as a way to elevate the race as we, uh, uh, in public eyes. The theory of racial uplift has often been demeaned as the politics of racial respectability, yet even whites in the first decades of the 19th century felt the nation was in need of overall moral uplift. So, you know, uplift in itself was not uh, something so uncommon as a rhetorical tool. Such ritual merges uh, in the 1820s, 1830s in particular, were to lead to the convergence of uh, black and white abolitionists. Yet, the whole theory of racial uplift changed the original perspective Allen had pioneered in the 1790s concerning racial prejudice. Now the blame was also laid on blacks, not only on whites, for the greater racism and discrimination they experienced. Another solution to deal with double consciousness was to turn one's energies toward Africa. Between 1808 and 1816, another famous figure, black entrepreneur Paul Tuffy, tried to start a company trading between the United States and Sierra Leone and to help free African Americans move to the British colony, which was free of slavery. This first migration effort was short-lived and fairly unsuccessful, but it was relayed in a very different spirit, as many knows, know, by the American Colonization Society uh, starting in 1816. This society was sponsored by whites mainly and meant to get rid of free blacks in an age of expanding slavery and racism. So the whole idea of the American Colonization Society was to send free blacks back to Africa. According, uh, yes, so behind uh, the, the ACS, uh, the American Colonization Society, lay the idea that, uh, in fact, white people in the United States didn't want um, Republican interracialism, they didn't want the universal equality, a real uh, democracy would bring about. So this uh, led to the disillusionment and, uh, of Richard Allen. He was then tempted to uh, move or to urge his fellow um, African Americans to move to Africa. However, his congregants rebelled against the whole idea of moving to Africa, uh, an idea sponsored only by uh, white uh, activists. And they reaffirmed their citizenship and their equal rights. So double consciousness was many things in the last 30 years of Richard Allen's life between 1800 and 1830. It was the feeling of belonging and yet not belonging to the American nation. It was the pride 
one could feel at the evocation of Africa and the opposition to any forced return there. Double consciousness was also probably a mix of anger and strategic treachery. From the period leading to the Civil War, black leaders, following the example of Richard Allen, relied on the written word, on petitions, pamphlets, and the launching of newspapers and magazines, while never dismissing the free trade rebellions and conspiracies which took place in the United States. To give an example, in the wake of Denmark Vesey's conspiracy in Charleston in 1822, Richard Allen hosted Minister William Morris, who had had to flee Charleston's black church to avoid prosecution and imprisonment. He was accused of being complicit with the conspiracy. Richard Allen would not denounce anger and rebellion. And he was also saluted by David Walker in a famous text by a black intellectual, David Walker's Appeal, published first uh, for the first time in 1829. And David Walker had kind words for um, Richard Allen. Richard Allen was primarily a minister, a man of peace and nonviolent, a man of God. Once it was clear the African American community opposed colonization, his church and the Philadelphia African American community as a, whole, as a whole became centers of opposition to the plan. In 1847, Allen lashed out at colonization in the newly found African American newspaper Freedom's Journal in an article which was extremely popular, appreciated, and circulated. He supported emigration to Haiti in the 1820s, emigration to Haiti being at the time a more acceptable prospect to, uh, than Africa for many African Americans. And more importantly, the last major act of his life was to help organize the first national convention of college persons in 1830. This paved the way for a new national scheme of abolitionist activity, which started developing the year he died. And that was it. Thank you.